Dear guest, kindly make sure that your mobile phones are switched off or are set on silent mode, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of His Excellency Professor Jamal Sanad al suwedi Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, we would like to welcome you this evening to a lecture titled U.S. Foreign Policy in the Asia-Pacific, delivered by Dr. Marcella Gania, who is an academic researcher and international journalist from Romania. Dr. Marcella Gania holds a PhD in American Studies, a master's degree in Security Studies, and a bachelor's degree in Foreign Languages. She does academic writings and research on topics including American Studies, geopolitics, media, and cultural studies, and discourse studies. She also writes critiques, reviews, and cultural and educational topics published in scientific papers and international databases. She is also a frequent speaker in academic conferences in many European and Asian universities. She is the author of the only book published in Romania on American exceptionalism and coordinator of the Belt and Road Initiative Research Lab. Dr. Genia is a regular contributor in international media such as International Policy Digest, Geopolitical Monitor, Eurasia Review, as well as Xinhua, the Chinese uh, press agency. She, uh, she has also written articles on geopolitics, cultural, culture, security, economics, tourism, China, the Gulf countries, space exploration, and, as editor, and she's an editor of her own geopolit geopolitical magazine, Geopolitics RO. And now, we would like to welcome Dr. Marcelia Genia to deliver her lecture. Doctor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of um, I, some ideas of my research on the topic the U.S. foreign policy in Asia Pacific. I'm extremely, extremely grateful for the invitation to um, His Excellency Dr. Al Swaidi, the director of the Emirati Center for Strategic Studies and Research and to his entire team who invested really a lot of time and energy and resources to organize my trip. They have been wonderful. This is me. So it's written uh, in a nutshell presentation that Mr. Abaid uh, has just delivered to you. It's not my first time in the UAE. I've come to this wonderful country over the past 10 years to write about events and institutions and personalities. So if you Google my name and um, then United Arab Emirates or Sharjah or other words related to the UAE, you can find article published in international media. And I'm very glad that now I can serve the UAE with my expertise as well. Well, the rise of Asia is reshaping the world and our mental mapping of the world. Asia Pacific has been always of interest for the United States over the past 70 years. And it remains the main region of interest because it is the world's fastest growing economy, 50% of the global economy, more than 25% of, of the global GDP, and the rising China has become a major determinant for the US foreign policy in Asia Pacific. So this is Asia Pacific, over 40 countries from very well developed like Canada, the United States to island, very small island countries. I'm making the distinction between the US foreign policy in Asia Pacific before President Trump and during President Trump because he introduced some new approaches. When I did research on the US foreign policy in Asia Pacific before Trump, and I have materialized this uh, um, research in this book, I focused on speeches delivered by US public figures between 2011 and 2018 because of four reasons. Uh, 
2011 was the year when global events forced the United States to adopt new strategies. The, the Arab Spring, the conflict in Syria, the death of the North Korean uh, leader Kim Jong-il. Then major policies were enacted, like the um, Wolf Law passed by the Congress, which prevents NASA from using federal funds in bilateral contracts of any kind with China. Also, the decision to remove the US troops from Iraq. Then economic and geopolitical challenges appeared, like the rising China, which became a concern. Its Belt and Road Initiative is likely to reshape the world order and cannot be ignored. It includes six economic corridors and one maritime route across 65 countries. Then, after Hillary Clinton's article on the new US foreign policy, published in Foreign Policy Magazine in November 2011, Barack Obama initiated the concept of rebalance towards Asia Pacific, which became the main theme of the US foreign policy. But Trump administration replaced it with a new concept of free and open in the Pacific, which is still to be clarified. So between 2011 and 2018, Asia Pacific was given the utmost importance the US was portrayed as having the main role in preserving stability in the region and the facilitator of prosperity in the region. A relation of power was always expressed between the United States, seen as leader, and the rest of the countries, in phrases that always suggested leadership, such as um, for instance, Hillary Clinton, if I may quote, in 2011, a strategic turn to the region fits logically into our global effort, effort to secure America's global leadership. Or uh, Tom Donilon in 2013, renewing US leadership means focusing on the region, and so on and so forth. Always the word leadership. Then the determination to remain the leader in Asia Pacific was always conveyed through the military presence and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They were seen as primary tools, but the military turned out to be more present. And the US, the United States failed to sign the TPP which became, as we know, the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, concluding it later on by other 11 Asia-Pacific countries, which represents now a block of 495 million consumers and 13.5% of the global GDP. China was acknowledged as becoming the main economic player, a serious competitor and a challenge to the US influence in the region, but not yet a threat. China's policies were criticized, but the US-China relation was mainly described in terms of cooperation. Starting with 2018, the US foreign policy in Asia Pacific has been undergoing a dramatic change that will require time and careful analysis to be understood because the new denomination of Indo-Pacific stirred confusion. Is it purely geographic or is it also ideological? Because the Indonesian interpretation is geographical. It refers to the area where the Indian and the Pacific Oceans mingle. And the Japanese interpretation is ideological, bringing India into the equation. The foreign policy in Asia Pacific is now binary. We have two foreign policies, one from Trump administration and one from Trump himself. They seem to have different views and different levels of commitment. Trump seems to pursue disengagement. 
he withdrew from the TPP. He suggested he would withdraw the troops from South Korea and Japan. He did not attend the APEC meeting and the ASEAN meeting in November, last November. So basically, Asia Pacific means three main preoccupations. North Korea, the military and the economic footprint, involvement in the region, and China. Trump started his presidency by voicing the foreign policy he had inherited, but one year later, we discovered that he started to take some actions. About North Korea, Trump had from the beginning a critical attitude, and he was urging all the nations to stand united against North Korea. And if you remember, Trump and Kim had a history of calling each other names. Trump had called Kim maniac, a bad dude, rocket man, a madman, while Kim had called Trump mentally deranged US dotard, unfit to hold the command of the country, a rogue and a gangster, and an old lunatic. And maybe the funniest exchange of tweets uh, took place in January 2018 when Kim threatened that he had a nuclear button on his desk and Trump replied that his button is bigger and more powerful. Six months later, however, in June, Trump managed to meet Kim at the summit in Singapore and they signed an agreement and their relationship became friendly. So that in September, last September, Trump said about Kim at a rally in West Virginia, he wrote me beautiful letters and they are great letters, we fell in love. Now, the involvement in Asia Pacific is decreasing and the binary foreign policy becomes obvious because if in November 2017, Trump had outlined a vision for a free and open in the Pacific and expressed commitment for the traditional relations. Eight months later, in June, when he signed the document with Kim, Trump actually revealed his intention to end the joint US-South Korean military exercises and to eventually withdraw the US troops from the Korean Peninsula where they had been stationed since the 50s. Because, I quote, the war games are very expensive and I want our soldiers out, but that's not part of the equation right now, he said. And indeed, the former Defense Secretary James Mattis explained that the US troops in South Korea were not part of the negotiations with North Korea. Recall that the United States had put on massive displays of um, force in and around the Korean Peninsula in November 2017, including three US aircraft carriers that sailed together with South Korean and Japanese um, warships. A bit later, in July, Michael Pompeo presented the Trump's administration strategy for a free and open Indo-Pacific. And the word commitment appears very often in his speech. He says all the time the US commitment is deeply rooted, the US administration is committed to expanding economic engagement to grow our presence in the region. However, in November, Donald Trump did not attend the APEC and ASEAN meetings. Vice President Mike Pence replaced Trump. And of course, analysts immediately remarked that Trump's absence would solidify the impression that America has abandoned its traditional presence in Asia Pacific. And I quote, it's not a good mood, move when you try to show the region how important it is. Despite Trump's absence, the White House came back and issued a foreign policy statement, very short, only 470 words, to mention Mike Pence's tour in Asia Pacific. 
meant to, I quote, reaffirm President Trump's commitment. To note that the US is not the only option for those countries, and China is also there. Japan and China have improved their relations lately. Prime Minister Abe visited Beijing in October 2018 in the first official visit by a Japanese political leader after seven years. And President Xi told the Japanese Prime Minister that he would also seriously consider a trip to Japan in 2019, which would be uh, the first visit of a Chinese leader after 11 years. And in December, last December, Japan announced that it is considering sending maritime self-defense vessels to the Chinese Navy's fleet review in April 2019 as part of expanding their defense exchanges. To note also that Australia has also chosen to remain a military ally of the United States, but it has very seriously engaged economically with China. And it considers its Belt and Road Initiative a chance to develop its economy. What about China? Well, China has evolved from competitor to a threat. The US administration currently sees China as the biggest threat to the US national security and a threat to the world. Michael Hayden, former head of the CIA and of the NSA, warned in March 2016 that a terrorist attack is not an existential threat to the United States, whereas while not saying that China is an enemy of the United States, I'm simply saying that if we do not handle the emergence of China well, it will be catastrophic for the world. Patrick Shanahan, the acting US Defense Secretary after James Mattis's resignation, during his first meeting with the US military branches in January, said, even as America fights militants in Syria and Afghanistan, the focus is China, 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 three times. The tension between the United States and China was obvious at the APEC meeting in November. The Chinese President Xi spoke of the need for global cooperation, international trade and issues solved only through consultation. Vice President Mike Pence spoke of war, warned Beijing to change its ways, and announced that the United States would build a military base in Papua New Guinea in cooperation with Australia to protect the Pacific Islands. And for the first time, the 21 APEC leaders did not agree on a joint statement, apparently because of China, but, despite the tension, the other nations did not get impressed and worked together in a very constructive manner. The Australian Prime Minister declared that Washington and Beijing were getting closer to resolving their dispute and called the APEC meeting a success. The Canadian Prime Minister discussed with the Japanese Prime Minister and the Australian Prime Minister the future of the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership. However, after the meetings, the uh, Prime Minister of Singapore made several remarks that help us understand what are the driving forces and the challenges in the Asia-Pacific region. He said that the rivalry between the United States and China is awkward for countries that do not want to have to choose between them. And the US diplomacy under President Donald Trump is deal-oriented and no more generous approach of the past. He also suggested that the trade war between the United States and China 
could be approached in a wiser manner by the two parties and in good faith. Uh, Trump's discourse regarding China has always been a combination of criticism towards China's policies, but, I quote, respect and affection for President Xi. In November 2017, he mentioned the, I quote, productive meeting in Beijing with the gracious host Xi. In November 2018, he held talks with President Xi in Buenos Aires during the G40 summit and showed openness to suspend the tariffs and to negotiate further on. He's not harsh on China, but only criticizes the business side tariffs and China's market distortions that affect what he calls the trade deficits between China and the United States. Some experts, however, consider that Trump's focus on tariffs is wrong and it is China's practices, such as theft of US intellectual property, that should be actually addressed. As you know, Trump also chose to withdraw from the Middle East. In December, he ordered the withdrawal of the 7,000 troops from Afghanistan. Also, during the unexpected visit in, uh, at the air base in Iraq, he decided to withdraw the US troops from Syria because, I quote, the United States cannot continue to be the policeman of the world and it's not fair when the burden is all on us, the United States. To clarify, however, that the United States remains the exceptional military power, he suggested that the United States can hit the Islamic State so fast and so hard that they won't know what happened. It remains to be seen whether um, the US withdrawal from Asia Pacific leaves room for China because if Trump decides that the United States, the strongest military power of the world, cannot continue to be the policeman of the world because the costs are too high and should withdraw after 70 years of unparalleled and exceptional leadership, we'll see what happens. Once again, the um, differences between Trump and his administration became obvious. And as you know, members of his administration criticized his, his decisions. Uh, James Mattis resigned, and Mike Pompeo, the US Secretary of State, immediately started a tour in the Middle East to reassure the countries about the US commitment in the region. Now, if Patrick Shanahan said the focus is China, 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 and if America, um, even if America fights the militants and, and if America withdraws from Syria and Afghanistan, the focus will remain China, right? How to understand Trump's new approach? Because a lot of people criticize And um, I, will, I shall refrain from uh, repeating words that I have seen in many articles and I have seen on TV channels. But I think in analyzing the differences between Trump and his administration, we forget one detail. Trump is a businessman who sees the world in terms of profit. He's tight-fisted and careful with expenses. He wants withdrawal from where costs are too high. His decisions are always expressed in terms of costs and burden. While the US administration has the tradition of maintaining global leadership at any costs with all the sacrifice required. It's a system that preserves an ideology it remains, however, to be seen whether Trump's pragmatic and business modeled approach also applies in foreign policy. 
Does the principle la noblesse oblige apply when we want to preserve status and prestige? Will the United States lose leadership if it voluntarily gives up certain roles on the global stage? Are these roles necessary to preserve its leadership? Will China take over? What about Russia? What will Russia do? To help understanding Trump further on, I shall quote Henry Kissinger's statement during an interview given to Financial Times in last July. And you can see on the screen what Henry Kissinger said. He said, I think Trump may be one of those figures in history who appears from time to time to mark the end of an era and to force it to give up its old pretenses. It doesn't necessarily mean that he knows this or that he's considering any great alternative. It could just be an accident. And I would add for myself, it does not necessarily mean that he's doing something right. Two more points to make. Obama also criticized the military intervention. I remember a, um, a speech while he was still a senator in 2002, and he was very harsh on the intervention in Iraq. He called um, those who took the decision, first he called the war a dumb war, and the decision makers, he called them weekend armchair warriors. And there were some other senators very much against the international interventionist policy. But once president, Obama followed the traditions of the US administration and said nothing more about the, this interventionist approach. I would also add that the division within the US administration is no novelty. But I also remember a speech by President Bush who once said in 2008, you remember that was right after the economic crisis and the Americans were scared and they were raising their voices against the government. And Bush had a very inspirational speech, which I remember, and he said that in the history of the United States, irrespective of disparities and differences in opinions, I quote, the elected officials rise to the occasion. That would be my main points because I'm limited by time. <laughs> and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gania, uh, for your informative and interesting lecture in which you have addressed uh, how the U.S. foreign policy in Asia, in Asia Pacific uh, during, uh, sorry, before uh, President Trump, uh, Trump administration and during President Trump administration with uh, a more focus on uh, the U.S. policy toward uh, China and uh, uh, North, Af uh, North Korea. And uh, in, addition, in addition to that, you have uh, shed some lights on uh, the Trump policy or uh, Trump policy approach uh, in general, uh, which can be described as the business, uh, businessman approach. And uh, in addition to that, you have uh, shed some lights on uh, some speeches delivered by major American leaders starting from 2000. Uh, 11, which is the year or the time that significant, significant global events, as you mentioned, uh, took a place where changes were made to major U.S. policies, such as the emergence of economic and geopolitical challenges to the U.S. global leadership as the rise of uh, China. Uh, and now we open the floor for discussion. Whoever has a question or comment, uh, please introduce yourself and kindly make sure that your questions and comments 
very brief so that other members of audience have the chance to participate. Uh, Dr. Saleh, freelance uh, researcher. Uh, really, my question related for the last three questions that you put it in the slide, I like it. U.S. lose leadership. I don't think so. It takes me a long time to lose leadership in this period of time. Will China take place? Also, I don't think so, because uh, the situation now in the world, multipolar world are no, I don't think so. My question, as we know as a people, that uh, the, the period of uh, Trump, I consider it a temporary period, period, maybe another four years, we don't know. Uh, my question, please, about the U.S. policy and the U.S. strategy. Because when we're talking about the policy and the strategy, there is a big difference between the policy planning and uh, on the, the high level. Who put the U.S. Uh, policy? Uh, Trump through the Twitter? We don't know. And who put the American strategy all over the world? Defense strategy, policy strategy. Until now, we mix between uh, what what the Trump decide within one minute, one second, before two days, as you know, know he, he said, Turkey, we will damage your economy. And after one hour, he changed his mind. Really, we don't know what's going on around us. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Let me see if I understood very well your question. So you are asking what's the difference between the policy and the strategy? Well, yes, indeed. Unfortunately, President Trump changes his mood too often, and everything is very unclear. I don't think someone could say what is very clear. Despite all the policies that are materialized in official documents issued by the U.S. administration, President Trump does not stick. What means strategy? Strategy means uh, implementation in real life. We I don't think we possess too many data about what the American institutions do around the world, but I'm sure they're working. And um, despite this appearance of Trump destabilizing, I'm sure that the US institutions will, will follow the same path in the same tradition. Uh, you made me remember a... Um, an interview with um, Friedman from Stratfor. It's a recent interview, and he said that don't pay too much attention to um, uh, President Trump's statements. We know that his style is a bit destabilizing, and the media, and we are all used to a certain uh, style of a real statement, of a real politician because it's his style. But despite this, I'm sure that the, the US institutions are doing their jobs. And I'm sure there are very hot discussions after this sudden tweets and sudden changes of mood with Trump behind closed doors. I'm pretty sure about that. Because America is the leader of the world and even Trump, Trump is not realizing what he's doing, but even himself would not like to lose this position. This is my opinion. Question? Fatma Likbesi, independent researcher. Doctor, you mentioned very briefly the withdrawal from the Middle East. So what's the relationship between the U.S. pivoting to Asia-Pacific and our reliance on them as our security guarantor? I know you said the U.S. cannot continue to be the policeman of the world, but the late uh, Sheikh Zayed used to call them the protector of last resort. 
So how would them pivoting to Asia Pacific affect our reliance on them in terms of security? The relation between Asia Pacific and the Middle East um, in terms of security. <clears throat> well, if you ask me from what I know about the Arab world, um, if the United States ceases in a way to be advisor and to intervene in the Middle East, I'm afraid that the Middle East will have to rely on the wisdom of their own leaders. You know, even in my country, um, we some, sometimes um, turn to embassies for um, advice. But I, I don't think this is very wise and very practical because the leaders of the country should know the best what is in their own interest. Um, I don't think we should really rely on the United States. We are in the 21st century. This is the difference. Given our experience of the past, we should have learned enough as leaders to protect our own countries. We're not in the 20th century. We were pretty mature in the 20th century. Now we should have the knowledge and the technology to do it by ourselves, and also the sk communicative skills. This is also something that matters in, in dialogue and in preserving security. Um, you know, in, in you, I will give you an example. I, I don't know how many of you are Europeans and you are aware. NATO is um, losing importance in, um, in Europe. NATO is and used to be a, the pillar of security in Europe. And we can see that it's losing a bit of visibility. Um, even the United States, uh, some um, Public figures uh, recently, it, well, Trump was the first one who said NATO is obsolete, in, as bad as NAFTA. So we are now reorienting towards a European defense strategy and towards European defense force. Things are changing. Um, there should be really no surprise if we lose one ally and we have to remake uh, our arrangements. I, I don't see a problem with that. Any comment or question? Okay. Thank you so much for this uh, useful lecture. Uh, I have a small question. We are the Arab, maybe elephant countries in Asia. Is there any role for the Arab in the American policy, especially the great president, Mr. Donald Trump, always he said every member should be active in economic and military activities. So what is the role for the Arab in this policy? Thank you so much. Shikran. In the Asia-Pacific policy, you mean? Mm. Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I think the um, Arab world, some of the countries in the Arab world, because, sir, we are aware that the Arab world is not very homogeneous. But I honestly believe that some countries, like the United Arab Emirates, for instance, which is extremely advanced, and it's involved 
it chose to get involved in international security structures, in all kinds of international structures. It's an example for the world. It can be very inspirational if it chooses to get involved. Me, for instance, I've been, for instance, I've been very, very impressed when the United Arab Emirates chose to organize the first mission for planet Mars. I'm uh, very familiarized with space, with astronauts. I go to um, conferences to write about uh, space and space technologies. And I was very impressed when I realized that only a few years ago, the United Arab Emirates uh, set up the space agency and they're already working with NASA for the first mission to planet Mars. This means that it belong, this country belongs to the elite of the world. Do you realize what it means, space technology? is the most advanced area of activity that can be in the world. This already gives a, you know, countries like the United Arab Emirates a special prestige and status. Um, there are some other countries as well can, can set examples through their activities. Of course, they can play a role, but I would specify those countries because some countries struggle with their own problems and some other Arab countries are really examples and they can set examples for the world. Of course they can, anybody can play a role. Any, it, it doesn't depend on the size, on the population. It depends, and I'm saying it again, on the wisdom of the leaders. I think we are running out of time. So, uh, Dr. Ghania, question? Or? Dr. Ghania? Uh, any last uh, comments you want to address the audience with or last words? Um, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to attend my presentation. Um, it's been very useful for me. I've le already learned a few things and you know that this kind of feedback is always useful. It gives us new ideas for new research further on. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Doctor. Uh, at the end of uh, this lecture, and on behalf of His Excellency Professor Jamal Sanad Suwedi, the Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, we would like to once again thank uh, Dr. Uh, Ganya uh, for her lecture, as well as you ladies and gentlemen for uh, attending this lecture, and hope to meet again in our future scientific events and lectures. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.